Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Bethel Church. God bless you, those of you that are joining us online. Good job remembering to move your clock ahead this morning. Some of you on my, online this morning, maybe that's why you're online. Maybe you forgot to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, good to see all of you uh, this morning. Turn with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 will be there in just a minute. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the most important event in human history. Now that's saying a lot because there's... There's been a lot of, you know, like history-altering events that have, that have taken place, events that are so huge you can actually say this event changed history, all right? So we're going to do a little quiz this morning, all right? Everybody with me? We're going to do a little quiz. I'm going to throw a few dates out, and you're going to tell me what significant event in history happened on that date. Okay, you ready? Everybody participating? Raise your hand if you're with me. All right. At least 25% of you, good. Okay, here we go. All right. So I'm going to give you the date. I'm going to start you off with an easy one. And I'll admit to you, these are kind of, you know, United States focused. Not all of them, but uh, just, you know, just because that's, you know, that's where we live. But uh, so July 4th, 1776, yes, the United States declared independence over Great Britain. That was an easy one, a warm-up. All right, this one's tougher, uh, and this one's not in the United States, all right? June 18th, 1815. You get bonus points if you get this one. 1815, all right? Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. It actually changed the course of history in Europe. Uh, September 28th, okay, we're going outside the realm of politics now. September 28th, 1928 was the day that penicillin was discovered. That was big, big change uh, in our world. Uh, okay, here's, a, here's another easier one. Uh, June 6th, 1944. My birthday. Uh, <laughs> I heard someone say it. Uh, D-Day, when the Allied forces landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, and it really changed the course of World War II. Uh, okay, outside the realm of politics again. Here we go. July 20th. I'm sorry. G yeah, July 20th, 1969. I, I'm hearing it over here. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, uh, first walk on the moon, July 20th, 1969. Okay, one more here. Uh, February 2nd, 2014. More recent. You should all know this one. No, come on. That is the day the Seattle Seahawks crushed the Denver Broncos. 43 to 8 in Super Bowl 48. Come on. Church, where have I gone wrong? <laughs> now, all important dates, but what I'm going to suggest to you uh, today is that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead is the most important, most history-changing, most reality-shaking, most life-altering event in human history. It's the resurrection of Jesus. So you might think, Tim, why would we talk about the resurrection four weeks in a row? I mean, isn't this a once-a-year Easter Sunday kind of talk? Well, there's a, a couple of reasons we're going we're gonna to be talking about this for a few weeks, and, and one of them is that it was core 
to the message of the early church. When you look at the book of Acts, read through the book of Acts and, and look, look at the weeks and all to the message of what were they preaching about. They were preaching about the resurrection of Christ. They were preaching about his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And of course, you know, many of those individuals that were doing that preaching were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. They'd actually physically seen Jesus and spent time with Jesus after he rose from the dead. So it was a, it was a huge deal in their hearts. Uh, and then a second reason why we should talk about the resurrection more than just once a year is that every blessing we enjoy as Christians finds its source in the cross of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. So I love teaching the how-tos of the Christian life. Uh, I love talking about the beautiful changes that Christ makes to our lives. I love talking about uh, the, the changes that Christ makes to our thought lives, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. I love talking about how God can bless your marriage and your family, how God will bless your finances, uh, how God will, will bless you as you're part of a church family. I love talking about the how-tos of the Christian life. But all of these blessings, all of these blessings are made possible only through the cross and the resurrection, right? So it, all of these how-tos of living out the Christian life, they all go back to the cross. So the Christian life, is, it's rooted in a historical event, but then it's experienced in the present. It's rooted in an historical event, but it's experienced in the present. Okay, So we've got this, this beautiful past event that's taken place, but the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection are things that we can experience right now. And this is what God has for his people. When Jesus rose from the dead... The curse of sin was broken. Satan was defeated. Hope was restored. Salvation was made available. Light overcame darkness. Life overcame death. Love overcame hate. Grace overcame the law. And it all goes back to Jesus rising from the dead. And so for the next four weeks, this is where we're going to be. We're going to be talking about the power of the resurrection. We see in the New Testament, there's a lot of teaching about the resurrection and the power that it has for our lives today. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 is one example of this. Start reading at verse 3 with me, follow along. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief, and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of far greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh man, what a powerful section of scripture. And what I want to do this morning, we're going to go back through this passage and I want to pour out, uh, or share with you rather, four present realities that are experienced because of the resurrection. All right, because of the resurrection, 
These are things that we now have in Christ. And the first one is this, our faith is alive. Our faith is alive. Okay, go back to verse three again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, so just make note of those words, underline, circle, make note of those words, living hope. Because of the resurrection, we have a living hope. Now, this word hope has a different meaning biblically than the way it's usually used in our, in our world, okay? Uh, many times we, we kind of use the word hope and the word wish interchangeably, okay? I hope this happens. We make a wish when we blow out our birthday candles, right? It's, it's, a, it's a wish, a, a, a hope, and it's, it's something generated inside of us. But the hope that we have in Christ is much, much more profound than that kind of hope. The reality is the hope that we have in Christ doesn't even find its origin within us. The hope that we have is something that has been birthed in our spirits by God. Hope is God's gift to us. And it's been birthed into our hearts because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Hope is something that's living, and it's living inside of us through Christ. Christianity, church, is not a religion. I'm going to say that again. Christianity is not a religion. It's much more than that. Christianity is not a political party. Christianity is not even a philosophy of life. At its core, Christianity is a relationship with a living God. A living God. And this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Every religion is based on ideals and rules. But Christianity is not like that. Christianity is an experiential relationship. It's not something that we just look back on with admiration. It's something that we enjoy right now. It's a living, living hope that's been placed in our hearts by God. And the evidence of this is that the power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead is still changing lives today. There are people still changed by what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And this is one of the Exciting things about being a Christian, it's not only the experience that we've had when Christ came into our lives, but it's a joy that we share with others who we see having that experience with the Lord as well. There is such great joy when people find Christ as their Savior. Amen? Yeah, and it should be the heartbeat of the church, seeing people come to faith in Jesus, right? Yeah, it's a living Hope. One of the things that I've really been excited about in these last, these last few months as we've kind of gone through the whole COVID season and all of that, and we had, you know, cut back so many of the things that, that we've been doing, it's been really cool to see uh, our, our men's small groups, our men's life groups just coming to life. I think there are just so many of our guys that have been saying, wow, I, I recognize now just how much I need the church. I, I realize how much I need my brothers in Christ. And so just kind of organically, uh, these different men's life groups have been growing and, and starting up. A couple of them I've heard lately have been going through this book called The Bondage Breaker. This is a book that we gave out several weeks ago at church. And, and uh, I'm hearing that a couple of our men's life groups 
They've been using this as kind of their guide for their study time. And I'm telling you, when you have a group of guys that start doing that and they start going through a book like this, watch out because the devil's in trouble. Man, things are going to happen when, and this is, not, this is not to diminish at all the role of women in the church. I'm just saying when, when men rise up in the church and decide that they're going to be men of God and they're going to be brothers together, watch out because amazing things are going to happen in that church. Amen. Yeah. And it is so cool. And I'm praying that the men of Bethel Church rise up in faith, rise up together in faith and unity, and let's see God do something new and great among us. Hallelujah. Yeah. We have a faith that is alive, church. Number, number two, second reality that comes into our lives through the resurrection, our future is secure. Our future is secure. If you go down to verse 4 in our text, and he's called us into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, and through faith are shielded by God's power, who are through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Once in a while, people will ask me, Pastor Tim, are we, in the, are we in the last days? And my response is, first of all, yeah, I absolutely believe we are in the last days. <laughs> but also, I know we're a lot closer to the second coming of Christ than we were five years ago. Amen? And as we look at the, the world around us, we see the prophecies of Scripture unfolding before our very eyes. Now, this has caused some Christians to kind of shrink back in fear as they've seen what's happening in our world. But I, I want to encourage you today that the pages of history are in the hands of Jesus. Amen? One of the amazing things about the resurrection is the fact that Jesus... Not only did he rise from the dead, but he also on several occasions prophesied that he was going to rise from the dead before he rose from the dead. That, that's amazing. If you've played basketball at all or hung around a gymnasium at all, you're, you're familiar with a game called horse. Anybody here ever played a game of, of horse? All right, In horse, if you've never played the game horse before, in horse, it's all about making, making shots, you know, making basketball shots. And, but the thing is with horse, you got to call your shot before you make it, right? So you got you to call where you're going to take the shot from. You got to call what kind of shot it's going to be, if it's going to go off the backboard. You got to call your shot, all right? And then you got to make your shot. Listen, church, not only did Jesus rise from the dead, he called it first. That's amazing, right? It's impressive. And it, it serves as this point of faith for us that Jesus can do what he says he's going to do. Right? Jesus is going to do what he has said he is going to do. So if Jesus could call his resurrection from the dead before he died, there is good reason for us to believe that Jesus will do everything else he said he would do. Right? And the resurrection then stands at this point of faith for us that that our future is safe in the hands of God. Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 5, all right? Revelation chapter 5. I want you to see this. Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, this is, this is God, with writing on both sides and a seal with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll 
or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Watch this. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who's that? It's Jesus, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So what does it mean when it says that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed? It's talking about the resurrection. It's talking about the fact that Jesus has defeated death. He has triumphed over the enemy by rising from the dead. And because of that, he is the one that has the authority to open the the scroll up by taking off each one of these seven seals. And as you read through the following verses in the next chapter, uh, you'll see that each one of those seals represents cataclysmic uh, world events uh, that take place. And, and Jesus is the one that opens the seal in the right time for each of these events to take place. In modern vernacular, we might say that Jesus was turning the pages of history, right? And that he alone is worthy to turn the pages of history. And, and things aren't going to happen before Jesus says they're going to happen, and they're not going to happen after Jesus says they should happen. They're going to happen exactly when Jesus says they should happen. Amen? And so what I want to tell you today is that your destiny, your destiny is not in the hands of fate or chance. Your destiny is not in the hands of a president or a governor or any other politician. Your destiny is in the hands of Jesus, and there's no better place to be. Right? And 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 it says he can do, he will do. And then a third present reality from the resurrection is this. Our trials are endurable. Our trials are endurable. They're not fun, but we can make it. All right? Verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice. You greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the believers that Peter was writing this letter to were going through the fiery furnace of persecution. These folks really, unlike us, these folks really, really knew what it meant to suffer for being a Christian. That's where they were. They were living it. Their Christian faith was being severely tested. And Peter says, here's, I want, here's how I want you to understand your, your trial. Here's how I want you to understand what you're going through. God hasn't forgotten you. In fact, God is using this for your good. He's purifying you as, as gold, just as gold goes through a refining process. It goes through the fire, and it burns out the, brings out the dross and every impurity. So every trial that we go through, friends, is for our good. God is perfecting our faith. Amen? He's perfecting our faith. He's purifying our lives. Remember this, God never wastes pain. God never wastes pain. He is always using it for our good. And remember, as you're going through a trial, Jesus is always faithful. Amen? He has defeated the grave, he's alive, and he's working in your life. Jesus is faithful. We all go through trials, all of us, to some degree or another. And I just want to encourage you, when you're going through a trial, you're not sure what to do next, here's what you need to do. Keep being faithful. Just keep being faithful. 
no matter what you're going through, keep being faithful. Keep on praying. Keep on reading the word. Keep coming to church. Keep loving your spouse. Keep being a good parent. Keep being a good friend. Just keep on. Keep serving. Keep giving. Keep loving. Keep being an honest person. Keep being faithful to the Lord. And God is going to get you through whatever fire you're going through. And in the end, you're going to be better off for it. Yeah. And then number four is this. Because of the resurrection, our joy, everybody say joy. Our joy is real. It's real. Don't let the devil rob you of the joy that God has for you. Come on, church. Yeah. Boy, it seems like joy is a rare commodity these days, and sadly, even among Christians. But God wants to give us a joy that rises above our circumstances. Amen? Yeah. 1 Peter 1 and verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, the salvation of my soul is something I'm pretty happy about. <laughs> Anybody with me? I'm just, I'm pretty, hard, I'm pretty happy about that. I'm pretty happy that my sins are forgiven. I'm pretty happy that Christ is living in me. Pretty happy that he's filled me with his spirit. And he's given me godly men and women to be a part of my life. Pretty happy that I don't have to worry about the future. Pretty happy that when I stand before God, I'm going to be admitted into his presence in heaven. Not because of my goodness or righteousness, but because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Pretty happy about all that. How about you? Yeah. So church, when you're tempted to get depressed by the things of this world, I want to encourage you, look to Jesus and be reminded that the main things, the most important things in life are yours through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. You're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. Hallelujah. What could be more important than that, church? What could be more important than that? I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. We're going to, we're going to just celebrate the resurrection by worshiping the Lord in just a moment. Listen, real faith in Christ, church, is more than simply believing that God exists, right? Right? Having faith in Christ means that we put our trust in him. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is what the resurrection points us to. It points to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And friends, that's the real question we have to answer about Jesus. Is he really Lord or not? Because our world will gladly accept the fact that Jesus lived, that he was a good person, that maybe he was a good teacher. They'll, they'll even accept maybe he even did a few miracles. But as soon as you start talking to people about Jesus actually being the Lord, that's where people have to make a decision. Amen? Jesus is much more than a good teacher. He's much more than a good man. He's much more than a miracle worker. His death on the cross and his resurrection mean that he is actually Lord. And a question we all need to ask ourselves is this, what does that mean to me? 
I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, Jesus is, is Lord in general, but have I really made Jesus the Lord of my life? Have I surrendered everything to him? Once in a while, I'll ask a person I'm in a conversation with, I'll ask them, how do you know you're going to heaven when you die? And a typical answer is this, well, I believe in God. I believe in God, which is good. But did you know that simply believing in God, believing that God exists, doesn't save you? You might be surprised to hear that because it's the typical answer. Are you a Christian? Yes, I believe in God. Well, according to James chapter 2, even the demons of hell believe in God and shudder. And we know they're not saved. So when we say to believe in Jesus, in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus. We're not just saying you believe that God exists. It means that you've actually put your faith in Christ for your salvation. You actually believe that Jesus died on the cross, he's risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Romans chapter 10 says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Church, this this puts the resurrection in a pretty high importance, right? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And so I want to invite you today, if you've never really understood this or made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you made the assumption, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church or I'm a Christian because I believe in God. That's a deception. Becoming a Christian means becoming a follower of Jesus Christ and putting your trust and your faith in him, making him the Lord of your life. So I'm going to ask all of you to bow your heads with me for a moment. I'm going to ask those of you who are joining us online, would you pray with me right now? Just close yourself in with the Lord. That's why I ask you to close your eyes. It's not a ritual. I just know that we're easily distracted people. And I don't want you to be distracted because this is the most important question of all. Have you made Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord? Do you really believe that he died and rose again and he's alive right now? Is he living in your heart? Has your life been changed by him? If it hasn't, I want to invite you right now to enter in to this life that Jesus Christ, the living Lord, has for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if today is your day and you want to pray to receive Christ as your Savior, to make him the Lord of your life, to really confess, confess that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he is Lord. When I get to three, I want to invite you to raise your hand. From the oldest person here to the youngest person here, this is your first Sunday in church or you've come to church for years we're all in the same place we all need to make the same decision is Jesus Lord have I made him Lord have I really put my trust in him or do I just kind of believe God exists when I get to three as I count if you want to pray to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord I want to invite you to raise your hand up high And you're saying, that's me, Tim. Today I want to pray. Today I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. All right? You respond when I get to three. One, two, three. Today you want to give your life to Christ. Raise your hand up. God bless you. Sir, right there in the back, I see you. God bless you. Any others this morning? 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you online, would you join me in this prayer? Church, would you join me in this prayer right now? Let's pray out loud. Lord, today, I recognize my need for you. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross for my sins. And I believe you have risen from the dead. Lord, today, not only do I believe in you, I'm putting my trust in you. I invite you to come into my life and make me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise this morning, church. Hallelujah.